Hi, and today we uh, continue considering various issues related to classical mechanics. And uh, you remember last Monday we discussed Newton's laws and we discussed the Galilean principle of uh, inertia. And today I would like to start this lecture from a small demonstration of Galileo's principle of inertia. Uh, what is this principle? It says that if there are no forces acting on a body, or all the forces are balanced, then the body keeps moving at constant velocity, or remains at rest if this re velocity is zero. So this is uh, An interesting installation, <coughs> an air compressor pumps air into the tube which runs along this bench and there are small holes in this tube and uh, you can feel that the streams of air go away from this tube and so, so that a body of such a form which fits the form of the tube will rest on the air cushion. And so this body moves without any forces acting on it. Actually, we have two forces acting on the body. Which forces? The first one is gravity pull directed downward, and the second force is the force of reaction. These two forces balance each other, so the net force acting on the body equals zero. And uh, the body keeps moving at constant velocity, practically only the air drag may somehow uh, retard the motion of this body. <coughs> and the net force is zero and the velocity is constant. This is the principle of inertia formulated by Galileo Galilei. And it will move and move until it encounters any obstacle like this one. It may move with constant velocity and the velocity may be larger or smaller or it may be very small, it may be almost zero. Uh, but when the velocity is zero and the body is at rest, this is no surprise, all the body around us are at rest. But when it moves slowly with constant velocity, this is interesting, this is surprising. We understand that there are no forces of friction and no forces of air drag, and so the principle of uh, Galilean, Galilean principle holds in this particular, uh, in this particular case. Now, without any air cushion, we have strong forces of friction and the body will not move in no way. The forces of friction will not allow this body to move. So, uh, Galileo formulated this principle of inertia, which uh, Newton made the first law of classical mechanics. Uh, <coughs> Galileo was a great scientist. He, uh, you remember how he discovered this, this principle. He, he, he allowed for uh, metal balls to roll down the ramp, to, to roll down the inclined surface. And uh, he studied the motion of balls and he observed that the balls move at constant velocity when they are on a horizontal surface. So he discovered this mechanical law. Also he made many other discoveries. He was not only a physicist, he was interested in mathematics and in astronomy, and he was one of the first scientists to use telescope to observe astronomical objects. And uh, he discovered the rings <coughs> uh, of Saturn, and he discovered many moons of Jupiter, and he made many astronomical discoveries. And as he observed 
the motion of planets. He uh, advocated the, the uh, uh, approach of Copernicus, who said that planets go around the sun, planets move, planets are orbiting the sun, and the sun is in the center of a solar system. And such a concept was called heliocentric, because sun is helios, and the helios, the sun, is in the center of uh, the solar system. Such heliocentric picture of our uh, planet's planetary system uh, was in contradiction with uh, the views of the church. And uh, uh, Galileo was uh, sentenced by the court of inquisition. He was sentenced to life imprisonment because he advocated the heliocentric uh, system. The church believed that the Earth is in the center of all things and that both the sun and other planets somehow move around the Earth. That was called a geocentric system. And the church said that the geocentric system is correct and heliocentric system is incorrect. And for this purpose, as Galileo advocated the heliocentric system, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. And uh, the Pope exonerated him only in 1992. That is just 29 years ago. The Roman Catholic Church admitted that Galileo was right. Only in 1992. That's it. Uh, so um, you remember last Monday we considered the law of conservation of momentum. Uh, the law of conservation of momentum says that the momentum <coughs> of a system of bodies remains constant if there are no external forces acting on this system of bodies. The momentum remains constant. And if the momentum was, for example, zero at the initial moment of time, then it will remain zero for some period of time. Dima, можно сказать больше? Now we will, I will show you an experiment, <coughs> a demonstrational experiment uh, showing the conservation of momentum. We have a small gun that will be, the barrel of this gun will be filled with ether now. Now the barrel is filled with ether. And now we have to shake uh, this cannon so that the ether is mixed with air. And this mixture can be uh, inflamed by uh, electric discharge. If you try to, OK. That's it. Thank you. Спасибо. So when the gun fired, this projectile uh, this rubber cork went in one direction while the cannon moved in an opposite direction. That's the, an, an illustration of the law of conservation of momentum. The momentum of the system of this body. We had two bodies, the cannon and the projectile. And initial momentum was zero, because all the velocities were zero. But after the shot, after, after the projectile started to move in one direction, the cannon started to move in the opposite direction. So that the velocities of the two bodies are directed oppositely, so that the total momentum remains zero, as it was before, before the shot. <coughs> uh, this principle, exactly this principle, is used in uh, motion of a rocket. 
including any, any space rocket. The rocket, <coughs> uh, there is a fuel inside the rocket which is uh, burnt in combustion chamber and uh, uh, very hot cases originating in combustion chamber go out at high velocity and the rocket moves in opposite velocity. Exactly the same principle is laid in the uh, motion of a rocket. Uh, so this is the, the motion of a rocket can be understood from the law of conservation of momentum. And we will consider this issue now. And this topic is called the motion of a body with variable mass. The mass of the rocket is variable because it loses some fuel. It burns the fuel and ejects uh, the hot cases with considerable mass every second. And so the mass of the rocket is decreasing while the rocket flies. So the mass of the rocket is uh, variable in time. And uh <coughs> in order to consider the motion of a rocket, we have to remember that if total momentum is constant, then it means that the derivative of momentum with respect to time is zero. Uh, actually, this is correct when only internal forces act on the system of bodies, like on, on the cannon with the projectile in it. Only internal forces act. So in this case, the total momentum is constant, and the uh, rate of change of momentum is zero because it's constant. But if there are external forces acting, if there are external forces, then the total change in momentum will be equal to the net vector of external forces acting on the system of bodies, acting on the rocket, for example. So we have some external forces. And therefore, we can write that the change of momentum will be equal to total vector of external forces, I will put it like that, without the index, index E. But we remember that these are all the external forces, the vector sum of all the external forces, times dt. This is the law of nature. This is actually the second law uh, of Newton, the second law of classical mechanics, and we will apply this law to the motion of a rocket. So in order to apply this law, let's consider in detail what happens when the rocket flies. We consider the situation at some time moment t, and I will draw a rocket which has a mass, and the mass is time dependent, and the rocket has some velocity. And then what happens at some next, at some moment of time, t plus dt? dt may be one second on one milli millisecond, or it may be a few seconds. It's, it's a small time interval, but anyway, it's a, uh, it's a finite time interval. We discussed this issue in the beginning. So in some time interval, we will have the same rocket. The mass of the rocket will be different. It will be the mass at the time moment t plus dt. And the velocity of the rocket will change. It will be the velocity at some time moment t plus dt. And what happens here? We ha why is the velocity changed? Because some of the fuel was burned and the hot case is thrown away with large velocity. So we have to consider some, some amount of fuel 
which was burnt and thrown away with some velocity. And I will denote this velocity of fuel by capital V. And the mass of this fuel, let's denote it by some character like d mu, a differential of mu. This is the mass of the fuel burned in the combustion chamber of the, of the rocket. So if I want to use this law, I need to understand what is dp. dp, the change in momentum, is the momentum of the system in time moment t plus dt minus the momentum in time moment t. So I have to, I have to take into account the initial and final momentum. The initial momentum here, momentum at time moment t, was equal to mass of the rocket times velocity. That's the initial momentum. And final momentum at this time moment, t plus dt, will be equal to what? The mass of the rocket times the velocity. And we have to take into account the momentum of this amount of fuel, which goes in different direction. But anyway, we, we write it in vector form. So I, I put it like vector v times the mass of fuel d mu. Now we have to understand what is m, what is the mass of the rocket at this moment of time as compared to the initial mass of the rocket. This coefficient here will be equal to the initial mass of the rocket minus the mass of the fuel, which was burnt and thrown away, minus d mu, d mu. And the velocity. And the velocity will be equal to uh, initial velocity of the rocket plus some increment of velocity. So after we after we have understood what was the initial momentum and final momentum, final momentum in this process after a short period of time dt, we can write down the equation, the law of physics, which is the second Newton's law. So the change in momentum is the final momentum, uh, final momentum minus initial momentum. Final momentum is written here. I will repeat it. That is m as a function of v minus d mu multiplied by v, the velocity, as a function of time plus some increase in velocity, dv. That's the amount by which the velocity has increased during the time dt and plus the velocity of the fuel of gases ejected by the rocket, capital V times the mass of the fuel burned, d mu. That's the final momentum. Now, minus initial momentum. Initial momentum was this one. Mv. So this was m of t times t 
times the velocity of t. The final momentum, this expression minus initial momentum. All this should be equal to f dt. So we have used the appropriate law of physics, the second Newton's law. And we have just taken into account what happens with the rocket when it flows, when it flies. The mass is changing. The velocity of the rocket is changing because some fuel is ejected with some velocity. And that, that's a small mass of fuel burned during time interval dt. So we have taken into account all these processes. And we are using the second Newton's law. That's it. OK. Let's continue. That will be m times v. plus am times dv. minus v times d nu minus dv d nu plus capital V d nu minus m v. All this equal to f dt. First of all, we see that this mv, this term, will cancel with this term, plus mv minus mv. Then we understand the two small quantities multiplied here will give us very small quantity, which is negligible. For example, if d nu is, well, like one millionth time of the whole amount of the whole mass of the rocket, that's a small amount of, small amount of fuel burnt in a short period of time. And dv will be also very small, like one millionth, time, one millionth part of velocity. Then here we will have one millionth part multiplied by one millionth part. That will be 10 to the minus 6 by 10 to the minus 6, and that will give you 10 to the minus 12 power, which is very small, negligibly small. This is negligibly small in comparison with other small values here. So we may disregard this term. It's negligibly small in comparison with other terms. Other terms are also small, because we have a small amount of velocity dv and small amount of fuel d nu. But these small quantities are of the order of magnitude, well, like one millionth, for example. And this term is of the order of uh, magnitude a million times smaller than other terms. So we may neglect it. And what remains here? I will combine the terms with d nu. And so we have m dv, the first term, plus capital V minus small v d nu. I have taken into account this one and this and this. And uh, all this will be equal to f dt.
what is this vector difference between two vectors, capital V and minus V? Capital V, I remind you, is the velocity of the fuel ejected here. And small v is the velocity of the rocket. What is the difference between these two velocities? I will denote this term by, by the velocity u, by capital U. And it's clear that if the velocity of the rocket, small v, is 0, then u will be equal to the velocity of gases. That is, when the rocket is at rest, when the velocity v of the rocket is 0, capital V will be equal to what? Actually, capital v, v will be the, uh, the velocity of gases measured with respect to the rocket, because the rocket is at rest. But if the velocity of gases is 0, then u becomes equal to minus v to minus v. So if the velocity v is 0, then u will be minus v. That will be the uh, velocity of the velocity of gases will be uh, will equal uh, minus v, so the velocity will be 0. So in this case, well, uh, uh, discussing this, this quantity in this way, we may easily understand that this is the relative velocity of the fuel gases with respect to the rocket. So that's the relative velocity of gases with respect to the rocket. Capital V is the velocity of gases with respect to the Earth, with respect to the system of reference system attached to the ground, as well as the small v is the velocity with respect to the ground. But when we take the difference of these two vectors, we obtain the velocity of gases relative to the rocket. So we obtain on this, on this uh, step, I will also divide this equation by dt. So I will obtain m dv by dt plus u d mu divided by dt equal to f. Now I will, I will do the last step. I will take this term into another side of the equation. And I will introduce a new quantity. If d mu is the mass of the fuel lost by the rocket, it means that d mu is minus the change of mass of the rocket itself. If d mu is positive, it means that some amount of gases, like, well, one kilogram, was burned and thrown away. But this is the loss of mass of the rocket. The rocket became, uh, the mass of the rocket became smaller by the same amount. So every positive amount of fuel burned means that the mass of the rocket diminished by this amount so that d mu equals minus dm, where dm is the change in the mass of the rocket. So taking into account these two facts, I will take this term here. It will be with minus sign. And then I will uh, change d mu. I will change d mu into dm, and another minus sign will appear here. So I will obtain m dv by dt equals f plus d plus u dm by dt. So in the previous e equation, I had this quantity d mu, which is the amount of fuel burned during time interval dt. And this quantity d mu by dt is the rate of fuel consumption uh, in the rocket engine. And when I moved this term into another part of the equation, and when I changed d mu 
by minus dm, I obtain this equation. This is the final goal of all our derivations. This is called Mischersky equation. Mischersky's equation. Uh, Mischersky was a Russian scientist of the 19th century, and he considered motion of bodies with variable mass. He did not consider rockets. He considered different situations. There are many cases in nature when a body has a different uh, di a variable mass. For example, when we have a rain outdoors, we have droplets of water falling down. Where do these droplets of water emerge from? How do they appear? First of all, very small droplet of water, very small microscopic droplet appears somewhere in the atmosphere, and it starts falling down slowly. And if the atmosphere is, uh, if the humidity is high, then there will be a process of uh, condensation of water vapor on the surface of the small droplet. And the droplet will fall down, and uh, due to condensation of more and more water, the mass of the droplet will grow, and the diameter will grow. And as the droplet reach, will reach the surface of the ground, the, the droplet will be large enough. Uh, it will be visible, and it will be a droplet of rain. So uh, the motion of droplet during the rain in the atmosphere is the motion of a body with variable mass, because the mass of the droplet changes. And uh, Mischewski considered such general case when anything is moving, any body m moves with variable mass. The body with vari variable mass moves under the action of some external forces. So Mischewski obtained this equation for a uh, motion of a body with variable mass. And this is the mass of the body at the time moment t. And this is the acceleration of the body, dv by dt. And this is the net external force. What is the net external force acting on the rocket? This is certainly a force of gravity and a force of air drag and maybe some other forces. Uh, so the net external force, this term, is the vector sum of all external forces acting on the moving body. And this is the relative velocity, in case of the rocket, a relative velocity of hot gases ejected from the combustion chamber with the velocity of gases with respect to the rocket, not with respect to the ground but measured relative to, relatively to the rocket. And this is the uh, rate of fuel, rate of fuel, uh, 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 rate of fuel <coughs> uh, loss, loss of fuel. As the rocket moves, it's losing some fuel, it's burning some fuel. So how many kilograms per second are burned? This, this is the kilogram per second, how, how much fuel was burned in the combustion chamber. Uh, so this is the equation describing the motion of a body with variable, variable uh, mass in general case. Another Russian scientist, Tselkovsky, Tselkovsky, also in the end of the 19th century. He was thinking about rockets, and uh, he derived the same equation. He came to the same mathematical equation. He did not know about the work of Mischersky. He, he arrived at the same result, and he considered, he applied this result to the motion of a rocket under the following assumptions. He assumed that the external forces are zero no external forces acting on the body. And he assumed that this velocity u is constant. 
the gases are thrown away with constant velocity with respect to the rocket. In this case, he obtained from this equation m dv by dt equals forces 0. And we obtain here u factor u dm by dt. We can multiply this equation by dt, and we can divide this equation by m, and we will obtain dv equals u dm divided by m. In this form, the equation can easily be integrated. And as u is constant, it can be taken out of the integral sum. It can be integrated. And integrating this equation, uh, we will obtain v. I will go to, I will go to uh, the scalar form of this equation. Because in vector form, well, it's obvious what's going on. What's going on here? It's quite, uh, it's quite clear. Now I will consider the scalar form form of this equation. After integrating, what is the integral of dv? It's just the velocity. Then the capital U, and what's the integral of dm by d dm over m? This is a natural logarithm. And also, in integrating, we have to use some undefined constant. Because if we differentiate this equation, we will, op we will obtain the, uh, this equation, m dv equals u dm, or uh, d dv equals dm over m. So if we differentiate it, the uh, derivative of constant is 0. So we will obtain the, the previous line. In order to find this C, uh, we must use some initial conditions, like at, the, at some initial time, the velocity was the initial velocity, and the mass was equal to some initial mass. And if we introduce here such Uh, initial conditions. So at, at the initial time, the velocity is known, the u is constant, the mass is some initial mass plus c. So from here we can find this c. And I will put it here. We know the, c, uh, the constant c from this equation. It will be equal to initial velocity minus u of initial mass. So the final relationship will be written here. The velocity, what is this velocity? The final velocity at some time moment v minus the initial velocity equals u is the common factor and logarithm final mass minus logarithm, uh, natural logarithm of initial mass. That will be, according to well-known formula, logarithm of final mass divided by initial mass. We will continue after a short break, a five-minute interval.
Okay, we continue discussing the rocket motion. Who noticed a small mistake in this line? There is a small mistake. I told you it's impossible to deliver a course of lectures without a single mistake. Who noticed it? So on this step, when I dropped the vector sign and went to scalar quantities, I made a small mistake because this vector dv is directed along the rocket motion. It's positive, for example. It's the acceleration of the rocket. It's the change of velocity, and the velocity is increasing. So this is positive. But vector u is directed in the opposite. It has opposite direction. So when I go from vector form to scalar form, I should have put minus sign here, because these two vectors have opposite direction. And so we will have minus sign here and minus sign here. Also, do you know this formula that logarithm a minus logarithm b equals logarithm a divided by b? Do you know this formula? Do you know it? OK, good. So you understand how we arrived at this expression. Now, to put it in the final form, I will uh, I will say that the final velocity, v as a function of t, minus the initial velocity, equals minus sign here means that I have to change denominator and nominator in this formula. So it will be plus capital U logarithm initial mass divided by final mass. That's the formula obtained by Tselkovsky. And this is called Tselkovsky's formula. For the rocket motion, if we know the velocity of gases and the initial velocity of the rocket, and how, many, how much fuel was spent based on the relationship between the masses, then we can calculate using this formula, the final velocity of the rocket. If we consider the forces, external forces, equal to 0, it means that we don't take into account the gravity, gravitational force. We don't take into account attraction of rocket to the Earth. How can we do it if there is a gravity pull? How can we neglect this force? If we neglect this force, it means that we consider a rocket somewhere far from the Earth, far in the outer space. For example, the rocket flies from Earth to Mars. And somewhere in between, far from the Earth and far from the Mars, the rocket makes some change in velocity. It burns some fuel and changes its velocity, far from the Earth, when we can neglect the gravity forces. In this particular case, we obtain this equation. We may slightly modify it. We can put the final velocity minus the initial velocity equal the velocity of fuel of gases. What is initial mass? Initial mass is the mass of the rocket plus mass of the fuel. And what is the final mass? If we spend all the fuel, then the final mass is the initial mass of the rocket without the fuel. So delta AM is the total mass of fuel spent in this action. If we know how much fuel we are going to spend, to burn, and we know the initial mass of the rocket and the initial f fuel, mass of the fuel inside the rocket. And then we spend this fuel, and we obtain the final mass of the rocket without the fuel. Then we can calculate the lo this logarithm and multiply it by the velocity of gases. And then we obtain the final velocity, 
of the rocket after this action of its engine. That's the, actually, this is the Tsiolkovsky's formula for the rocket motion. <coughs> Uh, Tselkovsky was the first scientist to consider rocket motion and to prove that using rockets it's possible uh, to arrange for an interplanetary uh, travels. It's possible to fly to the moon and to the Mars and to other planets. Tselkovsky was the first scientist who proved that this is possible. And he, he showed the way, how the method, how to solve this problem, how to realize the interplanetary uh, travel. So that's the Tselkovsky formula for the rocket motion. And now we will show you some simple uh, demonstration uh, how the rocket flies. We have a small toy rocket here. The rocket is filled with water. There will be no burning gases. Yes, here you can see the rocket is filled with water. And in order to throw this water away, we will pump the rocket body with compressed air that's exactly what happens in the rocket. In the rocket, the, the fuel tanks are pumped with some gas under pressure so that the fuel is pushed away. Okay, That's it. It goes. It works. The principle works. The prediction of Tselkovsky and the formula of Tselkovsky works. OK? It pushed water from, uh, it pushed water away, and uh, uh, water under the action of compressed air, water moved in one direction, and the rocket flew in another direction. Just like in this cannon, when the projectile went in one direction and, and the cannon went in different direction. The same principle the same principle. And the law of physics is the same. The law of conservation of momentum or the law of uh, second Newton's law of change, rate of change of momentum is determined by external forces. The same law. The same law but so different phenomena. The cannon and the rocket, well, they, they, they look different at first sight. But Actually, the same process goes on in these two different phenomena. <coughs> so now we consider, we continue consideration of <coughs> uh, the second Newton's law. There are still some important. <coughs> some important things to underline related to the second Newton's law. Uh, so this law says that if we have a system of bodies, it's not a single body, it's a system of bodies like a cannon and a projectile, a system of two bodies. We may consider a system of many bodies, three, five, one hundred, ten thousand, etc. no matter how many bodies the total momentum will be constant, will remain unchanged if there are no external forces acting on this system of bodies. We proved it last Monday. But if there are some external forces acting on the system, then the total momentum will change. And the rate of change of total momentum will be defined by the net external force. What is the net external force? It's the sum of all forces acting on all bodies, external forces acting on all the bodies of the system. If there are capital N, the number of bodies in the system, then we have to, to find a vector sum, vector sum of all the external forces 
acting on all the bodies on the first body when k equals 1, on the second body k f2 when k equals 2, etc. And what is a total momentum? A total momentum is the sum of all momenta of all the bodies from the first one to the last body number, capital N. That's the total momentum of the system of bodies. K, index K goes from 1 to N, capital N. In this relation, we will introduce some vector which is defined as the sum of such vectors divided by the sum of mass. So we consider many bodies, m1, m2, m3, etc., m4, m5, 6, etc. Somewhere there is body number capital N. We consider a system of many bodies. Each body has its radius vector, R1, R2, etc. In some capital, in some reference frame, with uh, uh, relative to some to some origin of this reference frame, all the vectors are measured relative to the same point, the same origin. And so we introduce such a vector, which is called the radius vector of the center of mass of the system of bodies. What is it? It's the sum of all terms like m, k, r, k. And what is the sum of all masses? That is the total mass of the system of bodies, total mass. All these bodies interact with each other and probably interact with some external bodies. So there are external forces and internal forces. And we have already proved that the internal forces uh, cancel each other in this equation. They are not taken into account. Only external forces are important in this equation. Only e external forces. And now we have introduced such a vector, which is called a vector of the center of mass. All the bodies here move in some way, and so all these vectors are functions of time. And if we are interested in the velocity of the center of mass, then we have to take a derivative of this vector. And in order to differentiate this ex expression, we put a dot here and a dot here, which means differentiating with respect to time. And so we obtain here in the nominator the sum over mk and what is the rk dot? This is the derivative with respect to time of the radius vector of the case point. This is the velocity, the velocity of, the of point number k. So this is the velocity divided by total mass of the system. And what is this sum? If what is the mass of a uh, point number k times velocity of this point. This is the momentum of point number k. This is the momentum of point number k. And what is the sum of all momenta of all points? This is the total momentum of the system of bodies. Total momentum. So we have obtained from these equations that the time derivative 
of the center of mass of the system of bodies uh, equals total momentum divided by m. This quantity is certainly called the velocity of the center of mass. This is the velocity, the vector velocity of the center of mass. And now, if we differentiate with respect to time this equation, we will obtain P dot equals total mass, the velocity of the center of mass dot. I just differentiate this equation. What does it mean? Total mass times the rate of change of velocity. Rate of change of velocity, by definition, is the acceleration of this point. So we obtain that the total mass of the system of bodies times acceleration, the vector of acceleration of the center of mass, equals the time derivative of the total momentum. And what is the time derivative of the total momentum? This is known to be the total sum of the external forces acting on the system of bodies. So we obtain this equation, the mass, total mass of the system of bodies times acceleration of the center of mass equals the total sum, the total of external forces. This formula is actually a theorem, a theorem on the motion of the center of mass of a system of bodies. It's called a theorem on the motion of the system of mass, as of the system of the center of mass of a system of bodies. So the center of mass is some point which does not coincide with any, not, should not necessarily coincide with any of the given points. The center of mass may be somewhere in space. If you, if you take a body like a ring, where will be its center of mass? Here, in the center, where there, are, there is no mass at all. All the mass is concentrated uh, along the rim, along the peripheral uh, of this ring. The mass is concentrated here, but the center of mass is, is some point in empty space. It should not necessarily coincide with any material point. So this imaginary point, there is nothing. There is nothing in, in it. It's an empty space. The imaginary point moves with some acceleration, which is called the acceleration of the center of mass, according to this law, which looks like the second Newton's law. But in its meaning, it's not exactly the second Newton's law. Because the second Newton's law says that if forces act on mass m, then this mass will accelerate with this acceleration. But here we have something different. This acceleration, this is the acceleration of some imaginary point which does not coincide with any mass point. It's imaginary point in, in empty space in most cases. And here is not the mass of a single body, but sum, the algebraic sum or scalar sum of all masses. This is not a mass of a single body. This is a total mass of the system. And this is not a single force. This is a total force, external forces acting on different points, on this point, on this, on this, on this. So here we have a lot of forces applied to different points. Not to a single point, but to different points of the system. Like forces acting on different planets in the solar system. And this is the total mass of the solar system. And that will be the acceleration of the center of mass of the solar system. 
which actually, in case of solar system, is somewhere inside the sun, not in the center of the sun, but somewhere inside the sun, if we consider the solar system. <coughs> so this is the theorem on the motion of the center of mass of the system of bodies. Now we will consider the motion <coughs> of two bodies relative to one another. Let's consider two bodies, M1 and M2. They are characterized by some radius vectors, R1 probably a function of time in general case, and R2 certainly a function of time. The vectors measured in some reference system with the origin in point O. You understand that each vector has a coordinates x, y, z. And in order to have a coordinates of vector, you must introduce some reference frame x, y, z. This goes without saying. I, every time I draw a vector, I imply that there is some reference frame and reference system, and that there are some uh, coordinates for each vector. I imply it. It goes without saying. You, you should understand that this is always the case, that we consider the motion in some, uh, the motion of these bodies in some reference frame. <coughs> so these bodies may somehow interact with each other. Well, let's say interact with some repulsive forces, as if they were uh, identically charged bodies. So they bear the same electric charge of the same sign, and so they repel from one another. This will be the force F1 acting on the first body from the second body, and that will be the force acting on the second body from the first body, F2, 1, and this is F1, 2. So we know from the second Newton's law that F1, 2 equals uh, minus F1, 2 equals F2, 1. And I will denote this simply by F. And I want to know what will be the change in time of this vector r as a function of time. The vector showing the position of the second body with respect to the first body. I know that the relative position of the second body with respect to the first body can be found as r2 minus r1, vector r2 minus r1. You can easily understand it if you take r1 to the opposite side of this equation, and you will obtain r1 plus r. r1 plus r will equal to r2, simple triangle of vectors. What will be the law of motion of each body? The law of motion of mass M1 will be M1 R1 second derivative with respect to time equals F, the force acting on the first particle. And the law of motion of the second body will be M2 R2, second derivative, equals the second force, F21. 
acting on the second particle. So from the first equation, R1, the second derivative, R1 with two dots, equals F12 divided by M1. And here, from the second line, I find that R2, second derivative, equals F21 divided by M2. And uh, I denoted F21 as by F. So that will be simply F divided by M2. And then F12 will be equal to minus F. That will be minus F divided by M1. And now I want, I want to find the information about the motion, that is, about the acceleration of the second body with respect to the first body. So I take second derivative of this vector. I have to, to put here two dots. That's all I have to do. Just, just distribute dots in order to take a derivative with respect to time. Very convenient. And so this will be found as R2 second derivative can be taken from here. I will substitute this expression for R2 second derivative. That will be F divided by M2 minus R1 second derivative, which equals to minus F divided by M1. I continue. Minus and minus will give you plus. So I take, I factor f, and I have, I will get 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2. This quantity I will denote by 1 over mu, some mass mu. It has, it's measured as uh, 1 over kilograms. So I denote it by 1 divided by some mass m. And so I will obtain here I will obtain here the force f divided by mu. So the acceleration of the second body with respect to the first body, that is the second derivative of the vector showing from the first body to the second body, this acceleration can be expressed in this particular way. So I will obtain finally that mu times r2 dots equals to f. F is the force acting on the second body from the first body. And what is mu here? Mu is, it's easy to calculate that mu is m1, m2, divided by m1 plus m2. This quantity is called a reduced mass mu is the reduced mass. And the reduced mass always appears when you want to describe the motion of one body with respect to another body, if these two bodies interact with, with one another. So again, we obtain uh, an equation, a differential equation, which looks like the second Newton's law. And this equation describes the motion of the second mass with respect to the first mass, that is vector r, looking from the first mass to the second mass. And here is the second time derivative, that is the acceleration, acceleration of this quantity, times some mass 
which does not coincide with the mass of any point. It's something different. It's called the reduced mass. So the mass, the reduced mass, times the acceleration uh, of the second body with respect to the sec first body equals the force applied to the second body from the first body, or by the first body. The force acting, the first uh, acting on the second body due to the first body. So again, we obtain something looking like the second Newton's law, but the mass is different, the mass is reduced mass. And uh, this, this equation is very important whenever you consider motion of uh, two bodies interacting gravitationally, like the Earth and the Moon. If you try to describe the motion of the Moon with respect to the Earth, you inevitably come to uh, the reduced mass. This will be the mass of the Earth, and that will be the mass of the Moon. Also, you have if you have a double star somewhere, two stars rotating uh, about the common center of mass, then the motion of these stars will be described by the same equation, which will be here will be the reduced mass of these stars, and that will be the vector of the distance of one star from another star. So this equation will describe the motion of a double star or the motion of a planet and its moon or a motion of a planet if, if we take a star and a heavy planet orbiting it, then again, that will be the equation. In quantum physics also, if we take a, an atom, so one mass is the mass of the uh, nucleus of the atom, like a proton in a hydrogen atom, and another mass is a mass of an electron. Electron and proton interact uh, electrostatically, and the same, the same procedure applies. And also, you will obtain the reduced mass calculated from the masses of proton and electron. And the reduced mass will not be equal to the mass of proton and will not be equal to the mass of electron. It will be something different. And this mass will play its role in the uh, behavior of hydrogen atom, the reduced mass. The reduced mass will play, uh, will be important for the behavior of uh, an electron inside the hydrogen atom. So uh, we have considered different consequences of the second Newton's law and different ways to apply the second Newton's law in some situations for the system of many bodies, for a system of many bodies. Uh, if you have a system of many bodies like a moon and the Earth, two bodies interacting gravitationally, then uh, you can calculate it and you can solve this problem you, uh, uh, analytically, the system of two bodies is a simple system which can be solved analytically. And you can analytically find the trajectory of motion of each body if they interact according to the, sec according to the Newton's law of universal gravi gravitation. But if you have three bodies, like a central star and two planets orbiting it, then in such a case, this problem in general case cannot be solved analytically. It can only be solved numerically using computers. Analytical solution is possible only in some limiting cases when the mass of some body, like a mass of a, of a star, is much, much larger than the masses of two other bodies. Or you have two bodies with comparable masses, and the second and the third body has very small mass. So in such limiting, simple cases, it's possible to solve this problem analytically. 
But if all the three masses are comparable, in general case, it's impossible to solve this problem analytically. That is, it's impossible to obtain in formulas to describe the trajectory and the velocities and accelerations of the three bodies interacting gravitationally. Uh, and if you have more than three bodies, this problem becomes so complicated that no analytical uh, expression, no an analytical solution is possible. And only numerical, only numerical solution uh, can be found for many body systems. However, even if you solve the uh, problems numerically, you have to rely on what? On the basic laws of physics, which govern the motion and interaction of bodies. So if you want to solve numerically some complicated problem, if, it, it, if this problem cannot be solved analytically, then you solve it numerically, but it means that anyway, you must rely on the laws of physics. And you must be able to apply the laws of physics correctly in your computer model of the phenomenon studied. You must be able to apply the physics laws correctly. If you don't know how to apply the laws correctly, no computer will help you. If you, are, if you don't know physics, no computer will help you to solve the problems. In order to obtain a correct numerical solution, you must have a good software which takes into account all the physics laws, all the interactions in correct way. If you don't know how to use physics laws, you will be unable to solve the problem, even if you have the most powerful computer. OK, that brings us somewhere to the end of this lecture. Next time, we will start from the work and energy in mechanics. And that's, let it be the end of this lecture. So, sequentially.